Let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight. Would you stand where you are and we'll just uh, take these needs to Him. Father, we're so thankful, Father, that we're in Your house and that we're able to come before You, Lord. We thank You, Holy Spirit, for Your presence that is at work in each, uh, each one of us, Lord, and, and how You deal with us, God, and how You draw us closer to Yourself. And Lord, uh, we just want to lift these up to You, Father, Father. Um, this grandchild, Father, um, all of these, Father Judah, and and this uh, woman, Father, that is that is also suffering, God, uh, with sickness, Lord. Um, we just pray, Angie's sister, Lord, that you would just be with them, Father, that you would strengthen them, that Father, that by your by your mighty power that is at work in us, God, that you would bring healing to their bodies. We still believe that, Father, that you are able to do exceedingly abundantly and above anything that we can ask or think. And we know that, Father, that it is your power that is at work in us, God, that is able to do that, Father. And we just pray, Holy Spirit, tonight that you would transform, that you would touch, that you would heal, Father, that you would deliver, God, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, that you would receive all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. Lord, we thank you, Father, even today, God, and pray for those, Father, um, that we're in the line of this storm, Father, and continue to be so, God. I just pray that uh, your presence, Father, would be with them, that you would watch over them, continue to protect them and keep them, God. Uh, we just ask that, that, Father, that your will would be done in all of these circumstances, God. We don't, we don't Father, even uh, pretend to comprehend or understand the things that you do, Father, for your thoughts are not our thoughts. And Lord, we just, we just thank you, Father, for your faithfulness and your goodness in all things, God. We lift up this service tonight, Father. We pray that, Lord, that again, Father, you would uh, anoint our ears to hear, Father, what, what you would speak to us, God. And let us not just be hearers, but doers of your word. And we pray that, Father, over every teacher today, Father, as they minister your word, Father, and, and all of those that will be hearing, God, that, that your power will be at work in us, God, uh, finishing the work, God, completing the work, God, accomplishing what you have commanded it to do in the mighty, mighty name of Jesus Christ, to you be all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. Amen and amen. Praise God. You may be seated. I was, I was wondering how I was going to act today. It's been four weeks since I've been up here on a Wednesday, so uh, we've had Missionettes, we've had Royal Rangers, we had Mike McGee, we had Brother David, boy, I tell you, it's been a, it's been a lineup. I was thinking, what's what's next? <laughs> but praise God, we're here, Amen. We've been talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of fire, and the need for the baptism in the Holy Spirit, and how that God uh, is is at work in us by His Holy Spirit. If you have your Bibles, Matthew chapter three. These are the. I'm, I'm going to read. Go, go over a few scriptures, and then we're going to get right into the into the message tonight. And uh, we're going to see if we're going to transition into the next part of this uh, message. Um, if we don't, we'll we have next Wednesday and the Wednesday after that. Praise God! It's it, it's so good. I I've learned. I, I know sometimes I feel like I'm in a hurry. I'm in a rush, but then I have to remind myself I've got next Wednesday. Praise God. Amen. And we want to make sure that we do justice to the Word of God in everything that we do. Matthew chapter 3, um, verse 11, um, he says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. John the Baptist is speaking here. But he that comes after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And then in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2, um, and this, is, this has been so, this is so powerful that the Spirit of God lives in us. He dwells in us. And, not, and, and I've said this oftentimes, not figuratively, but literally. The Spirit of God lives in us. Know you not that you, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. For those of us that are believers, our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 2, in verse 2, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a, as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat on each of them. And this was the symbol of Christianity that God was using, this cloven tongues of fire. See, the Bible says the tongue who can tame it. 
here God uses the cloven tongues of fire, meaning I can. And God is the only one. Isn't it something that we cannot even tame our own tongue? Um, because sometimes before we even think we're speaking, right? And then we're thinking, man, if I could just take back what I just said. And, and we can't tame the tongue, but Christ can if we allow him. And so we've been discussing the Spirit of God and His, in, in his power that is at work in us and the characteristics, characteristics that should um, characterize the, the, the church that is truly filled with the Holy Spirit because we are that church. We are, we are supposed to be effective as the body of Christ. Us individuals as believers filled with the power of God, the fullness of Christ in us. The Bible says that it's Christ in us, the hope of glory. And, and so Christ is in us. He didn't leave us alone. And he tells his disciples this. He, he, he told them that I'm not going to leave you. I won't forsake you, but I'm going to send the comforter. It's expedient that I go away. Because wouldn't it have been ju just been nice for the disciples to all their life have Jesus Christ there, that any time they had a need, a question or something, they could go to Jesus Christ. Well, what about the rest of us? We couldn't all do that in the, in the sense if he was here physically. He said it's expedient. In other words, he said what he was saying was if you knew how important it was for me to go that the Holy Spirit could come and be your personal counselor, your personal teacher, he would lead you, he would guide you, he would direct you. He was telling them you'd, you'd want me to go. So that he could come. And so, and so this is, it's important for us to understand the need for being filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, what we've seen in Peter is, is, is what Christ desires to do in us. How God filled him with the Holy Spirit, changed his language, changed his understanding as if right before, right in front of everybody's eyes. Isn't it an amazing thing when Jesus Christ comes and lives in us and we give ourselves, our lives to the Lord Jesus Christ, something changes in us? It's almost like what one way that pe people describe it is there's a burden that has been lifted. I don't know what it is, but something has changed. And that's, and that's a normal description for people that have, that have come to know Jesus Christ because He is the burden lifter, amen? He takes those things off of us. All of a sudden, you pick up the Word of God and you see it in a completely different light than you had ever been able to see it before. You're able to, to, to begin to read it and all of a sudden there's an understanding. Why do you think that suddenly you have an understanding of God's Word that you did not have before? I can tell you this, it is because of the Holy Spirit that has come to live in us. And now he is there. The Bible says that every word that is, that is written in this book was inspired by the Spirit of God, meaning that the author of the Word of God has now come to live in me. And if I need any explanation, I can go right to the author. Isn't that an amazing thing? I mean, I mean, I mean if you're reading a book that you just bought somewhere uh, and, and you can't understand a certain phrase, wouldn't it be nice to go to the author that wrote it and say, what did you mean right here? It'd be better than going to somebody else because he could tell you exactly what he intended right there. And so he, he causes Peter, because this is Peter, that, that they had declared, is not this the unlearned fisherman? And all of a sudden he speaks with such eloquence. In other words, there are mysteries that have been revealed to Peter in a moment's time when the Holy Spirit came on him at Pentecost. Now see, the Spirit of God comes and He lives in us when we, when we give our lives to Jesus Christ. But there is an endowment of power by the Holy Spirit that Acts chapter 2 declares here. And, it's, and, and it continues to declare through the book of Acts and through the rest of the Word of God that the Spirit of God comes upon us to empower us to be witnesses. And Jesus told this to the disciples in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, Tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Tarry in, Jer in Jerusalem until you are filled with power. Wouldn't it be nice tonight to know that you have a power that, can, that is more than equal to anything that you will ever face in this life? 
And the truth is, as a believer, we have access to that power, but we don't always use it. We, we give in to the temptations, we give in to the fears, we give in to all of these things, not realizing that we, assert, we serve a God who is more than enough. And so Peter, being a standard by which we measure ourselves, um, we can ask ourselves, um, have we been filled like we see the change that has taken place in Peter's life? Peter, a man who was filled with fear, all of a sudden stands boldly before those who had just crucified Christ and is willing to lay his own life down and tell them straightly that this same Jesus whom you crucified just a few days ago, God has now raised and he is seated at the right hand of the Father. And we, we went through all of this. You can go back and you can see it in, in, in greater detail in the week's previous. But the church that is, is returns to Pentecost um, she'll understand, she'll go to the, the Word of God and realize that there is real power in the Word. You see, I believe that there's a lot of Christians that don't believe that there's much power in the Word. They read it, they, they say that there's power. Intellectually, they, 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 they claim it, but they don't actually lay hold of it. Because if we truly believe that the Word of God was filled with power and these words were from God, then we would understand that every word that God has spoken is yes and amen. He is faithful and true. He will complete it. And he, he will accomplish everything that He has promised. Plain and simple. But we as believers, we don't always think that way. So it doesn't matter. If she, she, when she comes back, when the true church comes back, she'll, she'll, she'll see things differently. She'll walk in the power of signs and wonders and miracles. And nothing will be able to stand before her. And she'll have a boldness that, that does not cower or back down. And this is something that we need in the time that we live in. Because we see so many giving in to the pressures of this, of this world. There's so many that are giving in to the pressures of this world. And sadly enough, a lot of leaders, religious leaders, for fame, for fortune, for other things, have given in to the world and have sold everything for the things that this world can give. They, they want power. They want prestige. They want, they want people to come to their church and they're afraid to tell them the truth, not realizing that the truth is the only thing that can set them free. And so they tell them, you can go on living in your, your sin. You can go on living the lifestyle that you, can, you, you want um, as long as you just keep coming. And that's a sad thing. It's a sad testimony to the church of Jesus Christ. Give us boldness again, I pray. Give us boldness again to be able to stand up for what's true and not be afraid of what men might say. Because when we, when we stand before God, when, and I know that there's a saying, when we kneel before God, we'll stand before men. And, and I can tell you, it's, it's, it's so true. Um, what we need to do is we need to it's, it, not rely on the programs and everything else that, that are out there, but what we need to do is come back into the altar and once again break through in prayer and ask God to fill us full with the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that when we are changed, when we come to Christ, we are a new creature. A new creature created in, in, in Christ Jesus. We are, we are created in the image of God Himself. That's what the Bible teaches us. So the new creature is created in the image of God. And as the new creature, what we don't always realize is we have new faculties. All of a sudden, we have ears that can hear, eyes that can see, things that we've never heard before and things that we've never seen before. You see, we understand the words of God. We understand the things of heaven because the Spirit of God has now come to live within us. And all of these are gifts from God. And all of these we hold as stewards. Because um, that's all we can do. Is we, can, we, 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 don't, we don't build anything new. We just take what has been given to us and we steward them. We cultivate them in our lives. And we allow God to work in us. We decrease he increases. All these things, all the weights, the burdens, the curses, all of these things will be lifted from us as new Christians, as believers in Christ. So we need the power of the Holy Spirit. We need Pentecost once again in the church, in our lives personally. 
you know, we talked and we've talked a lot about it and churches have talked a lot about it for many, many years. But but there's been a lot said, but little seen. And I know that there's been some that have taken it to, to different places and they've made a mockery of the pen, of, of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. We're not talking about something that makes a mockery of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. We're talking about a real power that comes only from God himself through the Holy Spirit that lives in us. And we have received, if we have received the Holy Spirit, then, then we'll understand uh, the, the precious gift that has been given to us. Um, when we think about this, have you been filled with the Holy Spirit? And, and, and see, this is a question that Paul asked the people. They had, they had been saved, and he says, have you been filled with the Holy Spirit since you've been saved? And they said, we didn't know there was any such spirit. See, and when you ask people this, have you been filled with the Holy Spirit? The thing is, is if we have a question, then chances are we haven't been. And, and you know, we don't like that because I don't like to be on the outside, right? I mean, I, I like to be on the end. And so you'll have people say, oh, yeah, I've been filled. I'm blessed, filled with the Holy Spirit and this and that. And they'll say all kinds of things. And what they do is they negate the ability to receive because, because again, um, if we're not careful, um, we're lying. And so, have you been filled with the Holy Spirit? If you don't know that you've been filled with the Holy Spirit, then chances are you haven't been. Because even if we hesitate on this question, um, chances are we haven't been. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, I'm just going to go over just a few things because I believe that it needs to be. Um, when we think about the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit, how can we know that God has come upon us? The almighty, all-powerful God has, the omnipotent God, all-powerful, has come upon us. How can, we, how can He come upon us and us not know it? It's like standing out here in the middle of the in the middle of the summer in the sun and saying, "Well, is the sun out? Mm, I don't know." Your skin sizzling and, and, and oh, I don't know. Um, no, you'll know when God comes on you. See, it's the same thing at the day of Pentecost when Jesus told those disciples, "Tarry you in, in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high." It was like it, it was like. Um, I think my question, if I was there, because I would have probably been one of those disciples that, that had a lot of questions, and I would have said, um, how will we know him when he comes? <laughs> but see, here's the thing. I think there was an understanding. When he comes, you'll know. There will be no mistaking the fact when God comes, and he comes and empowers you. And on that day, they waited and they waited and they tarried and they could have asked themselves questions because as we said, it took, it took nine days and they were still there. Waiting and waiting. And, and, and maybe the question probably came, have, has he come yet? What, if, what are we waiting for? What, is, what, was, what was supposed to happen? What was supposed to take place? All of a sudden, the wind blew in. Not a, not a moment too soon, not a moment too late, the wind blew in. The Bible says the power of the Holy Spirit filled that place, cloven tongues of fire over them. They were, there was no mistake in God had come. And they knew it. There was an assurance. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, starting with verse 1. You should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be difficult times for people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents and ungrateful. They'll consider nothing sacred. Now let me, let me stop right there for a moment. They will consider nothing sacred. And let me explain to you something. Paul is not talking about unbelievers. He's not talking about the world that has not received Christ that does not know Jesus Christ, he is talking about the church. Because a great deception is going to be coming on the church. If you read the book of Revelation chapters 2 and 3, you'll see that God gives a, a record of the seven churches of that time. And he has nothing good to say for most of them. There's one of them that he does not condemn. 
But the rest of the seven, he has something to say about each of them. Why? Because apostasy has now entered into the church. All of a sudden, things have come into the church that shouldn't be there. And he says, and I'm going to start over so that you can read this or understand this with a, maybe a different revelation because Paul is not speaking about the world. He's speaking about the church. He says, you should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times for people will love only themselves and their money in the church. We know that that's in the world. But he's talking about in the church. And he says, they will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to parents, ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. Can I tell you, there are things that happen on the platforms of churches that would make our ungodly ancestors that did not know Jesus Christ turn over in their graves. I, I remember Brother Clendon was talking about this. He said his dad wasn't saved, but he was a good man. He says, and he wouldn't allow on TV what he saw on church platforms. Because they lived with at least morals. But these days, what we have seen in, in churches, on platforms... Ladies getting up there, and I'm not, and I'm not even and I'm not even joking. I mean, I mean, talking about all kinds of garbage and and showing themselves. I mean, literally doing this on purpose as a skit. Men dressing like women on the stage and acting like women on the stage of the church, doing some kind of a skit, trying to make them. Say, and it's like it's like. They will consider nothing sacred. When, when did this not become the house of God? And if we allow all that kind of garbage in, what, what, what won't we allow in? And so we see this even now in these last days. Verse 3, they will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others. They have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. Now think about this just for a moment now, and, I, and, and, and see because this is what happens when the church truly isn't filled with the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit has one initiative, one desire, and that is the will of the Father. And He will do nothing outside of God's will. And so a church that is filled with the Spirit and led by the Spirit will not do anything that is not according to the will and the purpose of God. And this is what he's saying. He says they will be unloving. I can see that and unforgiving. When, when somebody talks the way that I'm speaking tonight, I can guarantee you there are some church leaders out there today that would look at me and, 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 and they would be angry and seething at me and say that that is not grace. And they would, they would be the ones that are unloving and unforgiving towards me. Why? Because they do not uphold the standard of God. And this is what the Word of God is telling us. And Paul is, Paul is laying this out very clear. Verse 4, they will betray their friends, be reckless, they'll be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. They'll act religious, and see, see now, you, now you see where Paul is talking about these, this is the church. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. And, 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 and I hate to say it. It's just like Paul saying, stay away from a church like that. I'm sorry, but I'm not. They'll act religious, but deny the power that can make them holy. What's the power that can make us holy? The Holy Spirit. He's the only power that can make us holy. It is not me and my own abilities and my own strength somehow that I can make myself holy. And I don't think I'm holy because of all of my righteous and religious acts. Because a person can act religious, and that's what he's talking about. They go all the way through the motions, but they deny the one, the power that can make them holy. And so just because you go to church doesn't make you a Christian. Just like standing in a barn doesn't make you a horse. And a lot of people say, well, I go to church and I do this and I do that. Well, I can tell you this. We could go to church all our life and still go to hell. Plain and simple. 
And Paul is warning us. He says, he says, stay away from these kind of people. When you see them and the Spirit of God gives you the discernment to recognize the things that are taking place, he says, stay away from things like that. Why? Because what they do is they influence you and you become just like them. We need to be careful. Our mama used to say it like this. Show me your friends and I'll tell you what you, who you are. Because those, those influences have more power over our lives than we like to think. In 2 Timothy 3, in, in, in verse 8, uh, uh, this is what he says just a few verses over. These teachers oppose the truth. See, he's, he's talking about pastors. He's talking about leaders. He's talking about those who claim to be prophets and everything else. These teachers oppose the truth as Janus and Jambres oppose Moses. They have depraved minds and a counterfeit faith. In other words, they're false. That's what they are. It, it is a position in no, month, in, in no more. They have done it for the, for the wrong reasons. They stand in these places because it gives them prestige, it gives them power, it gives them other things that are appealing to the carnal man, to the flesh. And they love it when people follow them. I can tell you this, that, that could be said of every cult leader. Every false religion. What is it? It's taking away the glory from God and putting it upon the man. Why did they have to break away from the Word of God? Because, because they want to take the glory from God and they want to put it on themselves. And so these kind of people, they oppose the truth. And they have depraved minds in a counterfeit faith. This is coming from Paul, one of the greatest evangelists, greatest missionaries, greatest apostles that ever walked the face of the earth. A true man of God. And he is warning us that, and he's saying, in the last days, these are the things that you are going to encounter. And so this is true of much that is called Christianity. But the baptism in the Holy Spirit will express itself in the church by making Christ alive. And putting Christ where he belongs. First, foremost, above all, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. I decrease, he increases. See, what we have done is we thought that we got smarter than God and because we didn't have the power of the Holy Spirit at work in us and because the Holy Spirit isn't exalting Christ in churches, all of a sudden, what do we do to attract people? Because we don't have the power of God to do that. Well, I can tell you this, let's not depend on our own abilities, on our own, on our own wisdom and understanding. Let's depend on the power of the Holy Spirit again, and let's see what He can do. Let's be the humble donkey that rode Jesus into, into Jerusalem that day, and He got no glory for Himself. He was just happy that He was able to bear Christ on His back. Let us sink into the background and let Christ be exalted. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 22 that we are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. How? We are builded together as a habitation of God. A place where God lives. How? Through the Spirit. In other words, it is the Spirit of God that lives in us that causes us to be that place, that building that Christ lives. In Ephesians chapter 2 uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. I, I, I just, I don't know, I just love the Scriptures. I just love the Scriptures. Ephesians uh, 2, verse 19. So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. Together we are His house, built on the foundations of the apostles and prophets. And the cornerstone is Christ Jesus Himself. Verse 21, we are carefully joined together in Him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Through Him, you Gentiles are also being made part of this dwelling where God lives by His Spirit. And I, and I love this, where God lives by His Spirit. Not some generic form of God, but God Himself. 
That's why, that's why I'll say it and I'll say it again. It is God who lives in us, not figuratively, but literally. He lives in us. Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? I, I think that's so powerful. Don't you know that your body is the, the temple of the Holy Spirit, that Christ lives in you? That this is, this is not some generic form. This is actually God lives in me. And God lives in you. Now, knowing that God lives in you and God lives in me, how should, how should we act? What kind of people should we be? Because there's not a place that you go and nowhere that you can you run and, and there's nothing that you can think that God doesn't see and that God doesn't hear. <laughs> oh, my. It, it gets, it gets it, I mean, I'm telling you, uh, that's why I say oftentimes, Christians, um, Christians don't sin accidentally. Most of the time, Christians, I'd say the majority of the time, Christians don't sin accidentally. It's premeditated. Because right before you do, the Holy Spirit's there. If Christ lives in you, the Holy Spirit's there telling you, don't do it. You know in yourself, if I do this, this is... Mm. And then yet, you, you, you're, you're pushing past your conscience. And as you push past your conscience, you know what you're about to do and you know you shouldn't do it. And the Spirit of God is convicting you and you just, you ignore that moving or that urging of the Spirit of God. We need to be very careful as believers because Christ lives in us. And the thing is, is the things that we've allowed into the church or the body of Christ, which, which God did not allow. And which calls itself Christianity today in, in so many ways is a disgrace to the God of heaven. And it's a sad thing. It's a misrepresentation of who Christ is. When Christ walked this earth in a body like the one that we have on today. Those that stood around him said, who is this there was something different. There was something peculiar about Jesus Christ that caused others to look to Him, that caused others to question, who is this man? You know, the Bible says that as He is, so are we in this world. 1 John 3.17 As He is, so are we in this world. He's righteous. He's holy. So should you and I. As Jesus walked this earth and, and did the same things, we should be doing the same things. They should be asking the same questions about us. Who is this person? I mean, I know he's a human being. I may, I may even know their name. But there's something about them that is completely different. The Bible says, they asked and they said, never a man spake like this man. Never did anyone speak like him. Because when he spoke, the, you, you know, we know about the sea calming. We know about those things that Jesus did. But when he began to speak about the law, and when he began to speak the word, these words, when he began to lay hands on the sick and open the eyes of the blind, all of a sudden they began to ask, who is, who is this? A man, we have never heard anyone who speaks like this. It was almost as if they were saying, it's, it's, he, it's as if he wrote the book. Because not only did he speak, but he spoke with authority on the subject. And see, and as believers, we should speak with authority on the Word of God. Is God a healer? Absolutely, God is a healer. We stand in amazement for those who have given themselves to a point to where they, they actually believe what God has said. Well, that should be us. Every one of us. Where did he get this kind of authority to do what he is doing? These are some of the things that they marveled at. Where did he get this kind of authority? And, and Jesus Christ, he was a man, the Bible says, filled with the Holy Spirit. What? He was a man filled with the Holy Spirit who went about doing good, casting out devils and setting all of those that were bound, setting them free. And the same thing 
should be said about you and me. When we look through the book of Acts, if you read that book of Acts, you'll go one by one. They were walking in. They were, they were raising people up. They were healing the sick. They were doing all of these things. The same things that Jesus Christ was doing. And they were standing back thinking, who are these men? See, when they stood and they looked at Peter, they said, is not this the ignorant fisherman? And yet, he speaks with such wisdom and eloquence. Where did he get? And then the Bible says this, that they took notice he had been with Jesus. And see, and here's the thing. When people begin to speak about you and me that way, the thing that they're going to understand is, we have been with Jesus. I, I, I don't say this lightly, but um, when you spend time with Jesus, when you truly spend time with Jesus, um, you can't help but change. How can you spend time in the presence of Almighty God and not be transformed? The Bible says that we are transformed into His likeness. The whole purpose of God is to conform us into the image of Jesus Christ. And the Bible says as we behold Him in the Spirit, we are changed into His likeness. In other words, as we look at Him face to face in prayer and in the Word of God, and we are constantly looking upon Him, we are being transformed, we are being changed every single day. And our life is like a light that shines brighter and brighter unto the perfect day. They said to him, they said, we know this man is a sinner. The blind, man, the blind man who was just healed said, whether he be a sinner or not, I don't know. But this one thing I know, I was blind and now I see. And can a sinner do this? Just say it. All of a sudden, they're, they're, they're questioning. They don't like what they see. They can't explain it. And so then they begin to make, make assumptions. I can tell you this. They're going to hate you just like they hated him. That's what he said. Because if you were one of them, if you were like them, they would love you. A church full of the Holy Spirit is to be just that. Filled with the power of the Spirit. There was a story of a young lady, or she was an elder lady, Sister Walsh. She was a Lutheran girl. And this was back in the days when Pentecost was just coming in, 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 in a greater way. And um, she went home and her, and her parents told her, they said there was a little church there meeting in the storefront. And they said, just be careful when you pass by that thing. She had to walk by it on the way to school. So every day she'd walk by it and... She said when she'd get about pretty close to it, she'd cross the street and she said she'd run as fast as she could to get around it and get back and just to, just to go home. She, so every day she was afraid of that Pentecostal church. And one day, obviously she came to the place where God touched her life and she became exactly that. But here's the thing. They're not afraid of the Pentecostal church anymore. The Bible says that when this Pentecostal church began, they turned the world upside down. And the kings and the governors of those cities said, now they've come to our city. They were afraid. What are they going to do here? Now they welcome you in. Oh yeah, you can put it wherever you want. Doesn't bother us because you've been, you, we have been conformed to the image of this world. And we're just a part of society. They just add us to their, to their rosters and to their roles. The Bible said great fear came upon the communities. When that Pentecostal church had begun, hypocrites fell dead at the altar. Dead people were raised to life. Miracles of God were present. The community was afraid of them. Why? Because they were a people that God lived in. Has God changed? No. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And for those of us who are willing to, to, to let go of everything and relinquish everything unto Him, He will come and He will live in us again. And they will say of us the same thing. Who are these people? But now they've come into our city. See, Ephesians 2 and 22, we are builded together for a habitation of God by the Spirit. 
It is the Holy Spirit that is bringing us together as the body of Christ, a place where God lives. We are not merely a church with a name out on a sign. We are the body of Jesus Christ, filled with the power of God, with the life of God, to to affect this community, this city, this world for Christ. That's why we're here. What what are we doing? Do do, do we come do do we come to church just for a Bible study? Do we come to church just to say, oh, I I checked the box? Do we come to church and, and just do these things just to go? But no, we come to church that we can learn of Him. So that we can be be filled with the fullness of the Spirit of God that lives in us. So that God can have His way in us. How far we've drifted from, from the thing that was birthed on the day of Pentecost. How far we've drifted from that Azusa Street in 1906 which sent missionaries across the world and they packed their clothes in caskets because they knew they were not coming home. They would never see this land again, and so they left. Men and women filled with the power of God where they gave everything up, and they went knowing that they would never return home. Gave themselves to be slaves, gave themselves to other things so that they could witness to the other slaves. Just like John on the island of Patmos, which God sends there, filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. A man who was, they say that the reason that they put him on the island of Patmos was because they tried to kill him by boiling him in oil and tar and and trying to to kill him. But he, he, he was a man that couldn't die because God wasn't done with him. He was so grotesque, they said, to live with or to look at that they sent him to the island of Patmos where they would send lepers and other things. Think about that. God loved the lepers, so he said, John, I need you to go there. And John said, whatever you want, God, I'll do it. Why? Because they had one purpose. That was to glorify God, to live for God, and to live for God alone. The church of Jesus Christ that calls themselves the church of Jesus Christ is so far from what they claim. But if we look forward today, it's, it's different than what we know it to be. I know we don't like to think about it. We don't like to hear it. But uh, most of the churches just become a religious institution. They do, they do not even know the God that they claim to know. As Leonard Ravenhill said, and I love what he said, they, people will say, I know the Word of God. He says, that's okay, but do you know the God of the Word? And that's the difference between really being a follower of Jesus Christ. Is we can know the Word of God, but do we know the God of the Word? When those are filled, we're filled with the Holy Spirit. God sent them across the world. He sent them into every other foreign religion, into every pagan religion, into the harshest environments, into the most hostile communities. And yet they took the word of God and and with their life, they planted that seed in the soil with their blood and Christ won that city. Because somebody was willing to do whatever it took. They could not do that apart from being filled with the Holy Spirit. Because even though we we, we might have a lot of zeal to do something good, Nothing but the Spirit and the power of God and the grace of God could drive us to do something so courageous because none of us are really that courageous. It wasn't for a lie because no no one would die for a lie. It was the truth of God's Word that they were willing to be the seed that would be planted even as Jesus was the seed because He said unless the seed dies and goes into the ground, it will not bring forth fruit. They say that many times the the way that the gospel gets into the hardest places, these religions that don't want it, is by the blood of the saints, the martyrs that go on and they plant their lives as a seed into that soil. And through that, God convicts and brings out a people. I think of Stephen when he's standing there before Paul and they're, 
they're getting ready to con convict the man and they begin to stone him and they throw the, the garments of Stephen at Paul's feet and Paul has given orders because he has received orders to kill Christians and to murder those who are claiming Jesus Christ. He does not understand at this moment. And they throw the cloth at Paul's feet and the, he watches as Stephen is stoned and Stephen all of a sudden stands up and just as Christ, he looks up and he says, I see the Son of God standing at the right hand of the Father. And the heavens have now opened and he sees Christ and they stone him to death and they've given him to Paul the clothes. I can only imagine what went through Paul's mind and what went through Paul's life. Paul said, I'm, a, I'm the chiefest of sinners. Why? Because once he came to the understanding when he had that experience on the road of Damascus and then he was blinded and, and, the, and the prophet came and prayed and the scales were taken off of his eyes and Paul was sought the Holy Spirit. He had come to himself and realized that the blood of the saints was upon his hand. He said, I am the chiefest of sinners. I am a debtor to every man. I owe my life to this Christ. And yet, the church of today has no convictions, no love for Christ. That's what Paul said. When they told Paul and they bound him because again he had seen Stephen. And they bound him and they came up. He, he said, I must go into Jerusalem. And the prophet came up to him and took the garment of Paul, wrapped it around his hands and said, the man who owns this garment, they'll bound, bind you in Jerusalem. And Paul said, what mean you to break my heart? Don't you know that I'm not willing only to go and be bound in Jerusalem, but I'm willing to die if necessary? Maybe you don't know me. Maybe you don't know what Christ has done in me. Maybe you don't understand the price that has been paid for me. I can get caught up in this world and all the luxuries and all of the things of this world, but I can tell you this, the Holy Spirit's the only one that can make known Christ to me. And Paul said, I'm willing not just to be bound, I'm willing to die and be planted in the soil of that city so that my people can know Jesus Christ. You can't kill a man who's already dead. And Paul was a dead man on furlough. He was already dead. And you can't kill a man that's dead. He said, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who gave Himself for me. You can do what you want with a, with a dead man. He won't, he won't argue you. He won't complain to you. You can drag him anywhere. You can kick him. You can spit on him. He's dead. He has nothing to say. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who gave Himself for me. And that was Paul's declaration to those. There's nothing that can ever take the place of seeing Christ. Paul saw Christ on that road. Paul saw Christ not just with his eyes, but he saw him with his spirit. I can tell you this, when you get a glimpse of who Jesus Christ is, everything, everything, everything changes. Isaiah was a perfect example who stands up in, in the book of Isaiah chapter 6, I believe it is. The Bible says in the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah says, I saw God high and lifted up and His train filled the temple. See, Paul, his uncle was Uzziah. His uncle was the, was the man in charge. And Isaiah had a job and he had a, cush, a cushion job. Yeah, everything, his life was set. All of a sudden, in that year that Uzziah dies, he finds himself crying out to God because now his future is completely changed. And while he's calling out to God in prayer, all of a sudden he sees God lifted up. He sees the throne of God and everything changes. And then you read the book of Isaiah. They say Isaiah was one of the greatest prophets, if not the greatest prophet to ever live. He prophesied more about Jesus Christ than any other prophet. He had seen God and everything had changed. 
I pray that God would give us a revelation of who He is. And that God would open our eyes and that we would, we would be filled with the wisdom of His Spirit. The first work of the Holy Spirit when He comes into, the, into us is to present the object of perfection. And this is what He says about Christ. He says, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. He never said that about me. He never said that about you. He only said that about Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. The beautiful thing is, is when the Holy Spirit comes and lives in me, so does the Son. And he, when He sees me, He doesn't see me. He sees the Son. And when I live by the Spirit, and I do not walk according to the flesh, and when I live by the Spirit, then God sees His Son in me. And He can look at us and He can say, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. What are we living for? What do we give our lives for? What are we wasting our time on? Once He presents the object, then He makes it known to you and I that all of the dealings that He will deal with you and me are going to be along these lines to make us like Jesus Christ. Every bit of the way when God begins to do something in my life, when He reveals a sin, when He reveals something that He doesn't like, what He's doing is He's bringing up or showing me the standard. This is my beloved Son. This is what I'm desiring out of you. And this is what He's bringing us to, is to become like Jesus Christ. In all of His dealings, it's the object of His Son. All of His dealing to rid me of things uh, is, is to get rid of those things that are not of Christ, so that, so that I can decrease, so that He can increase. Everything, everything, everything. We want to be purified. That's why He said, be holy as I am holy. And we can't be holy without the Holy Spirit. Because He's the power that makes us holy. The only reason for the creature. The only reason for you and me. Is to contain the Creator. The only reason that you and I were created. Was that so God could have a vessel, a body to live in. And I pray that that's, that's, that's our heart as the body of Christ. Is that God can come and He can live in us again. He can fill us with His glory. He can fill us with His power. And, and we can come to that place where He alone is glorified. Amen. Father, we thank You tonight. We thank You, God, for what You do continuously in our lives. We pray, Holy Spirit, that You would strengthen us, that You would quicken us, that You would give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, that we may be transformed into Your image, Christ. We do not want to speak of You, Father, as if You are not in this room, because we know You are right here in the midst of your people, and you live in us. I pray that God, that you would help us to understand, Father, that our life is not our own. That we have been bought, we have been purchased by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would help us to, to see and to know that God, that we are not distracted by the things of this world. That God, as we see all of these things taking place around us, God, that it would only reassure us that we truly are living in the last days. And that God, that you have called us to be a peculiar people, to be set apart from this world and its standards. I pray, Holy Spirit, that as you come and empower us, that you would empower us to be holy even as Christ is holy. I pray that, God, that we would get serious about the things you have called us into, about your word, about the calling you have placed upon our lives, of how you use us, God. Help us to 
to give ourselves completely over to you. Teach us your word. Show us, God, your purpose, your plan, and your will for our lives. And we pray, Holy Spirit, that we would walk in them. And that, Lord, that as you deal with us, God, whatever it is, we pray that you would purge us of everything that is not of Christ. That, God, that we can truly be a witness for you in these last days. A mighty and a powerful witness. Not in our own strength, Holy Spirit, but only by your presence that lives in us. Because we cannot do any of these things apart from you. We are praying, Holy Spirit, for that, for that Pentecostal fire to once again fall upon us as the church. May we set our hearts to seek you. May you be our sole affection, our greatest desire is to have fellowship, Holy Spirit, with you. To know Jesus Christ and Him crucified and resurrected. That God, that in Jesus' mighty, mighty name, we may attain, even as Paul said, unto the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That God, that when you come back for your people, God, we will be ready. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, to you be all the glory. All the honor and all the power. Amen and amen. Praise God. Praise God. He's so good. He's so good. Thank you for being with us. I pray that again, that we would not just be hearers of the word, but we would be doers of the word. Great thing is this, is when you go home and when you contemplate the things that you've heard, even tonight, and you pick up that, that Bible and you begin to read throughout this week, that you would pray and say, God, help me to become what you're asking me to be by your Holy Spirit. And I can tell you this, God will begin to deal with you in ways that you, would have, that, that you and I cannot imagine. He will do exceedingly, abundantly, and above whatever you can ask or think according to His will. In Jesus' name, we love you and God bless you. In Jesus' name.